Ozone, the molecule you see here shown on the left, drew considerable interest at the turn of the century due to its depletion. Here are some images that show how in a 20 year span from 1981 to the year 2000, the amount of ozone in our upper atmosphere, particularly above the poles, began to deplete. You can see that by the intensity of the color indicating a decrease in its concentration. This led to action in the Montreal Protocol, which soon reversed this trend. And it's good to say now that the ozone layer is well on its way to healing. So this program is going to take a particular look at ozone and its protective properties. First of all, let's take a look at the structure. I'm going to begin with oxygen gas. Oxygen doubly bonded to another oxygen. The strength of that bond is given in our IV data booklet is 498 kilojoules per mole of bonds. Here's the structure of ozone. It has three electron domains indicating that those domains form a flat triangle at about 120 degrees. The presence of the one unbonded pair distorts that 120 degrees, reducing it somewhat to around 117. So ozone is a bent molecule. From this picture, I can see the identi or identify a double and a single bond. So it contains a bond of 498 kilojoules and a single bond of 144 kilojoules based on this structure. Problem though with experimental evidence suggests that the bonds are of identical length. That contradicts our model. Our model here would predict a shorter double bond and a longer single bond. It also indicates the bonds are of equal strength, 363 kilojoules, which lie somewhere in between these two values. This can be explained by taking a look at the concept of resonance. In resonance, what we can do is the presence of that double bond could also be with the oxygen on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. In fact, it tends to alternate between those two structures. Alternating between those two structures then leads to sort of a blending or a hybridization of a double and a single bond. Sometimes that's depicted this way with a dashed line and a single line indicating a resonant bond. And these two bonds would be of identical strength. Now let's take a look at how ozone protects us. To begin with, I'm going to want to look at the relationship that exists between the wavelength and the bond energy. I'm going to take a look, first of all, at the oxygen double bonded to oxygen. First of all, we know the energy to break that bond is 498 kilojoules per mole of bonds. So here I'm taking 498 kilojoules and dividing it by the mole. That gets me the energy associated with a single oxygen double bonded to oxygen. Now I want to take a look at the energy in that bond and connect it to the concept of wavelength. What wavelength or color of light would be needed to break that bond? To do that, I'm going to look at some equations that are present in our IV data booklet. At the bottom in chapter 12.1, there's a relationship between energy, H, which is Planck's constant, a value that never changes, and the frequency of the light. Frequency is that symbol that looks like a V. There's also a relationship between the speed of a wave, C, is equal to its frequency times its wavelength. So I'm going to take these two equations and combine them. I'm going to replace the frequency, the symbol that looks like a V here, with C and the wavelength. And it gives me the second expression that you see. Now substituting in my values, H, Planck's constant, never changes. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. C is the speed of our wave, which in this case is light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Again, a value that doesn't change and is also in your IV data booklet. Divided now by the energy that I require to break that bond. That then gives me that the wavelength of light I require is 2.4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, or 240 nanometers, nano standing for 10 to the minus 9. Let's look at where that lies with our electromagnetic spectrum. You might recall from earlier work, this particular diagram, which shows the various components of the electromagnetic spectrum, stretching from X-rays to radio waves with longer waves. Now, where does 240 nanometers fit in here? Well, if we take a look at the ultraviolet region, it's broken into three regions, A, B, and C. 240 nanometers fits right between the C and the B ultraviolet range. So that particular wavelength of light, what would happen is that any energy that's in this wave 
range would be sufficient to break the oxygen-oxygen double bond. Hence, oxygen gas by itself is fairly useful at removing ultraviolet C, which is a shortwave form of the uh, ultraviolet spectrum. It possesses what we call germicidal properties, the ability to kill germs. Now, if we now add to this what happens when we use the oxygen resonance bond, we change the 498 to 363 kilojoules. And I repeat the calculation and I arrive at 330 nanometers. That 330 nanometers would also encompass not only the C range, but the B range of ultraviolet light. The B range of ultraviolet light is attributed to the formation of skin cancer and eye irritation. So essentially that resonance bond is capable of absorbing ultraviolet B light and removing it uh, from the sun as it comes down towards us. So the two of them together essentially remove ultraviolet B and ultraviolet C, allowing only ultraviolet A to reach Earth. Let's look at some of the chemistry then of the reactions that take place in the atmosphere. As mentioned earlier, we can break the double bond at wavelengths of ultraviolet light less than 240 nanometers. So we break the double bond forming what are called two oxygen radicals. So that symbol, the oxygen with the dot, is the symbol we use to represent a radical. Now a radical is a species with an unbonded pair of electrons. And if we take a look at the Lewis dot diagram for oxygen that we form here, we can in fact see that there are two unbonded pairs of electrons. The next step that happens in our process then is that the oxygen radical combines or collides with another oxygen molecule to form ozone. Now, the fact that we form two oxygen radicals in our first reactions means that this reaction happens twice. If I add these two reactions together, I get the following overall reaction. So at wavelengths under 240 nanometers, essentially I am producing ozone. Now, when we move to a range between 240 and 330 nanometers of ultraviolet light, we break ozone apart, turning it back into the oxygen gas molecule and an oxygen radical. That radical can then in turn collide with an ozone molecule to make two oxygen gas, giving me this overall equation, the exact reverse of the equation up above. So essentially in our upper atmosphere, we have a balance between these two processes. Ideally, we would like the production and the removal of ozone to remain constant, or what we call a steady state. The introduction of CFCs into our atmosphere back in the 1960s led to the development of the ozone hole that you saw earlier in the program. And as mentioned earlier, the establishment of the Montreal Protocol essentially banned their use, allowing the ozone to return back to its steady state. Please don't hesitate to post any comments or questions. Thanks for watching.